Regaining leadership on the world stage, US President Joe Biden is meeting world leaders in Europe and he's promising America is back. But after four tumultuous years under his predecessor, what can Biden deliver? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiyadeen. In Cornwall, on the southwest coast of England, the world's seven largest powers are meeting to discuss a daunting list of weighty issues. The talks will be dominated by vaccine diplomacy, climate change and rebuilding the global economy. The UK is US President Joe Biden's first stop in his eight-day trip to Europe since taking office in January. Biden has said he's determined to rebuild transatlantic ties and reframe relations with Russia after four rocky years under former President Donald Trump, whose tariffs and withdrawal from treaties strained relations with major allies. Biden is meeting leaders on the sidelines of the group sessions. John Hull has more from Falmouth in Cornwall. It's an extremely important week, this, for Joe Biden, no doubt. The uh, US president's first trip abroad since taking office five months ago, and he's here in Cornwall face to face with perhaps the most important allies that the US has. And he's here with a very clear message for them, uh, in his own words, to show that the US is back, back to a, a global leadership role, back to more traditional forms of multilateral uh, diplomacy. And the Allies, of course, extremely keen to embrace that message, uh, particularly as their economies emerge from the pandemic, perhaps looking for fresh uh, global direction uh, and still very fresh in the memory, the era of Donald Trump, confrontational unpredictable. Will it succeed? Will Joe Biden convince them? Well, this meeting already uh, proceeding on the basis of agreement rather than discord. He will move on from here uh, to Brussels to further shore up alliances with NATO and the EU and construct what he describes as a coalition of democracies, a united front for when he sits down next week with the Russian president Vladimir Putin and expect Joe Biden's approach there to be very, very different to his predecessor Donald Trump's, who, of course, rather famously cozied up to the Russian president. Well, let's bring in our guests from Alexandria, Virginia. PJ Crowley, former United States Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. From Brussels, Karol Lano, CEO of the Centre for European Policy Studies. And from Moscow, Vladimir Sotnikov, political scientist at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Thank you all for joining us. PJ Crowley, Biden wants to deliver this message that America is back. But is he planning to bring anything concrete to this G7 summit and the meetings beyond, uh, other than these slogans and that very impressive vaccine pledge? Well, the vaccine pledge uh, is very meaningful. But I think first and foremost, it's about you know, bringing relations uh, uh, within the G7 and beyond, you know, back to normal. You know, and, and normal has two implications. You know, one is uh, without the rancor that we had seen, you know, during the Trump years. And, and the other is to help the world uh, get back on its feet uh, in light of the pandemic. These are enormous undertakings. And it will be important for the United States, you know, and the other leaders to demonstrate, you know, that uh, democracies can deliver results you know, given the competition, the real competition that does exist you know, between the West, Russia, China. Well, given the priorities then, is this a sign that, uh, of more robust American engagement coming in worldwide down the line? Or is the priority really to, to get this normality established? Well, I think the United States, you know, has engaged. The question is, has it been constructive? Uh, you know, for example, when Donald Trump first went to Europe, he he he, he suggested that uh, Europe owed the United States a great deal of money. You know, when when Joe Biden uh, you know visits with other NATO leaders, uh, I don't think that's going to be uh, you know part of his lexicon. Uh, Donald Trump hesitated to invoke you know, Article Five of the NATO treaty that the United States would come to the defense of of its NATO allies. So I I do think that. Uh, you know, constructive engagement is what the Biden administration is hoping for. 
it is meaningful. But as we see with these um, you know, ambitious plans, whether we're talking about vaccines, talking about climate, talking about the global economy, the challenge for all of these leaders will be you know, delivering results that their people you know, can tangibly feel. OK, and let's turn to you, uh, Carol Lanu. Uh, what does the EU want from this G7 and the, the subsequent meetings with Biden that are set to take place in the, the, the days that follow? Uh, because certainly, yes, the message America is back is being delivered. Joe Biden is not Donald Trump, so relations uh, arguably will be slightly easier. But in concrete terms, what does the EU and Europe as a whole want to see come out of this summit? I mean, the first thing is, as the Assistant Secretary just said a moment ago, also that global or cooperation amongst the democracies of the world is working, but also that the EU is taking serious. And that's also why Charles Michel, the President of the European Council, arrived as well with a vaccine pledge to the summit uh, this morning, said, look, the EU will deliver 350 million vaccines to the world. Um, but there are other important issues which have to be discussed, which is, for example, the recovery, public finances. There is uh, a very important issue, which is the Green Deal, uh, the carbon issue. And uh, Charles Michel also said in an interview this morning, uh, the US needs to price carbon. So that's a very difficult issue to discuss. But there are also other international issues which have to be discussed, which are on the agenda, which is uh, China. I think uh, extremely important to, let's say, that there is a common line towards China from the G7. And there is also Russia in the preparation of the important uh, Putin, Putin, uh, Putin uh, meeting uh, on uh, Wednesday. OK, well, let's turn to Russia then. Vladimir Sotnikov uh, joining us from Moscow. Does Russia miss being in the G7? This must be somewhat painful for Vladimir Putin to watch from the sidelines because, of course, it used to be the, OA, the G8 and uh, Russia's no longer part of this club. Uh, well, what do you mean by saying miss? You know, uh, we were suggesting when there was a um, collective decision of the J7, I guess it was uh, several years ago, well, uh, right in 2014, when after the starting Ukrainian crisis over over Crimea, uh, the G7 decided to for Russia to get withdrawn from 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 J7, J J8. Sorry, so I, I don't think that Russia too much miss, missed uh, this uh, this uh, thing because uh, uh, Russia actually uh, is a self-sufficient country, self-sufficient country, and uh, despite all the troubles uh, with uh, not being a part of the J7 or G8, whatever you name it. Russia still enjoys uh, its um, its uh, own pace and enjoys its own policies. And all of the countries in the, the, the G7 are self-sufficient. Part of the discussions that are going on, Vladimir Sotnikov, to try and present this united front to tackle the big issues of the day. What is Russia hoping for? The G7 obviously is, is a part now. But Russia's got an important meeting coming up with Joe Biden. So, so what is Vladimir Putin going to be looking to get out of these meetings? And is it hoping to jump on the bandwagon to help join these initiatives to kickstart the global economy and to fight the pandemic? Uh, well, you actually raised a very good and very important questions in your um, uh, in your in your answer in, in your asking me actually. I, I would like to say that uh, um, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is, uh, genuinely wants uh, to uh, significantly improve uh, the uh, relationship uh, with uh, the United States and uh, as well as with uh, J7 countries uh, taking uh, at all, taking uh, taking them all. And actually, uh, this is a genuine genuine desire and. Uh, uh, we uh, didn't put any preliminary conditions and we say that, OK, if we, 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 we would very much like to develop relations with the European Union, with J7 countries and with the United States. I think that the ball uh, is in the, uh, their part of the, of, the, of the field, actually. I mean, the, the, there should be, the, if there is a genuine desire of our partners uh, to improve the relationship, not stopping and not uh, pushing Russia against, uh, say, the so-called Navalny problem, so-called, well, Ukrainian crisis or anything like that. 
I think that uh, the general desire would be that uh, Russia would cooperate, would cooperate with uh, J7, uh, would cooperate with the United States, and uh, uh, eventually Russia could again become, well, in some time, I don't, I'm not sure that it will be very soon, but uh, in some time Russia would become uh, again the part of the a partnership country of the J7 or uh, J, uh, J8. Okay. Um, so, PJ Crowley, then, Russia appears to be uh, willing to cooperate. No preconditions to talks. They want to be friends again. Uh, what's the, the US approach going into these talks with Vladimir Putin? Well, um, you know, some of the crises that, uh, you know, my colleague in Moscow mentioned are not so-called. They are quite real. Uh, you know, the Russian incursion into Ukraine, uh, the Russian attempts to either poison or jail uh, its political opponents, you know, Russian interference in, you know, Western elections, including the United States. Uh, and now, you know, Russia harboring uh, cyber cr criminal enterprises that are extorting money from uh, businesses in the United States and elsewhere. Um, I'm sure these issues will be on the agenda for Joe Biden. Uh, he will address them forthrightly uh, with Vladimir Putin. Uh, I think we have low expectations as to you know, what's going to come out of this. The, the reality is that the areas where the two countries can cooperate is shrinking. They're still there. Arms control would be you know, one. You know, regional issues such as getting uh, the parties back to the Iran nuclear deal may be another. Uh, but the areas of conflict between the two countries uh, and, and between Russia and Europe uh, are realistically expanding. So this is about manning a, managing a very difficult relationship in the short to midterm, not improving it. And, and, uh, Carol Lanu, from the European perspective, uh, is the EU going to be looking for assurances from Joe Biden when it comes to taking the, the relationship with, with Russia forward? Because Europe's quite split, split on this, is it not? Certainly the Eastern oh, members of the bloc are very keen to make sure there's a strong uh, response to Russian actions, but Germany's very reliant on Russian oil and Russian gas, and Italy as well. They want to rebuild yeah, those but I think on Russia they are. Sorry, I think on Russia they are aligned. It's probably on China that we are not so aligned. But even on China, I think we are getting closer to that. If you see certainly over the last year, uh, actions by national parliaments, let's say clear um, uh, pronouncements against violations of human rights in China, etc. Also on the situation in Hong Kong, for example, that is that is clear. But um, I mean, on Russia, I think we have a common line. And certainly, if you see the reaction which we've seen in Europe on uh, what's happening in Belarus and also the support from Putin. To what Lukashenko is doing, let's say, to the, I mean, the horrible conditions which uh, all these people are getting, which have uh, some opposition to what the regime is doing. I mean, I think there's a strong consensus in Europe that we need to do something about this. The problem is just that we feel, I mean, mightless, let's say, against this regime. And, and that's why, I mean, Europe is extremely happy, let's say, that we have Biden in the White House and that there is strong cooperation. And I think that Biden has even delivered more than we expected in the beginning. I mean, take, for example, about reinstating the troops uh, which Trump wanted to get out of Germany. I mean, that's one of the first things which Biden said, which comforts Europe that there is a security support from uh, the United States. However, Europe should be aware, let's say, that it needs to do its part of the game as well on the, on the side of, for example, the troops. And that the issue which you mentioned in the beginning about uh, Trump always insisting on this trade surplus which Europe has, and this trade surplus, by the way, has been increasing all the time uh, during the Trump years and, and continues to increase. It's about 150 billion now for goods. I mean, this is also something on which Europe should be aware of, that it needs to do something and probably at certain occasions unilaterally reduce tariffs which it has on certain goods which are being imported from the United States. Um, Vladimir Sotnikov, from the, our, our two guests in the US and the EU, they say that they have a lot of common ground and they do want to put up a strong front against Russia. But despite years of this, I mean, Russia continues its foreign policy path unabated. Does Russia feel that the, the G7 just isn't relevant anymore? Russia doesn't fear the sanctions that are being put on it. So, so what's the point of another strong statement from the G7? Is Russia bothered at all uh, by what is happening at this summit? 
Uh, yeah, you raised actually a good point. Actually, Russia, Russia. What I can tell you, what Russia stands for, actually, and what what is the Russian position towards J7 summit or anything like uh, like uh, as my esteemed American colleague said that uh, uh, ongoing and real crises are going on in Belarus and the uh, Ukrainian crisis, uh, the so-called poisoning of uh, Mr. Navalny and uh, whatever else. Uh, Russia actually. Uh, for for all years of these sanctions, Russia got used uh, to uh, these uh, joint uh, positions uh, of uh, um, uh, United States and the European Union and European and uh, J7. And uh, where well, I, I even uh, will be brave to say that uh, Russia has uh, idiosyncrasy actually to to this uh, to this point. So this is your point, and I agree with that. That uh, the, the 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 strong the strong the strong statements on behalf of the uh, J7 uh, seems to be irrelevant for the moment because I think that uh, for Russia uh, the Belarusian Belarus crisis and uh, whatever Navalny crisis or uh, Ukrainian crisis. These are the matters which should be tackled not without, uh, not uh, without, uh, sorry, without the external interference. And Russia will say. Well, it, I'm sure it those countries level. would but agree, the, sir. The, the Ukrainians would agree that there should be external interference. There shouldn't be Russians fighting on their soil. Uh, well, mm, what do you, what? How can you explain? What is the Russian interference? I mean, that the, I. I um, well, uh, Russian invaded I, Crimea. I mean, and Russia is supporting uh, was, the the, the, the sorry, president sorry, of, sorry. of Belarus. I mean, we could have this argument, but let's not have this argument now. This illustrates the differences between the two positions, the position from the US and the EU and the position from Russia. You can't even agree on what crisis actually exists. So when you have problems like the coronavirus, tackling climate change, rebounding the global economy, how are any of these issues going to be worked on? Do you think, Vladimir Sotnikov, that common purpose can be found with European and uh, American uh, leaders? Uh, yes, I think so, actually. I, um, let, me, let, me, let me start all over again. I mean, that uh, uh, first of all, first of all, as uh, you mentioned in uh, the um, uh, Crisis, uh, crisis with uh, Crimea. Actually, this is a reality that uh, Crimea is now a part of Russian Federation. This I is a reality. I, 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 no don't, I don't want to talk about Crimea. Yeah. I want to talk about the broader issues because you yes, have one position I, I, no, no, and others have other no, I positions. Proceed, I will proceed to the. Sorry, let me. Let me. I, I'm sorry for for my interruption. Let me conclude my point of view, my argument, as you said. So please. Uh, so as regards uh, coronavirus. Uh, global economy and other um, pressing issues. Russia actually very well wanted uh, to cooperate with European Union, with United States, because, for example, uh, coronavirus uh, crisis, the coronavirus pan pandemic, is the global threat to all humankind, and Russia only supports any common actions towards this, right? Okay. You okay. agree with that? Thank you very much. Uh, PJ Crowley there. So with the, the vaccine pledge uh, was made ahead of the G7 summit, um, are, can we expect other me measures, for example, the, to, to tackle climate change and, and uh, other measures to help boost the, the, the economy? Because it, it's, it's easy to, to release these statements and wishes, but what kind of concrete action, I hate to come back to this point, but are you expecting concrete action uh, to come out from this summit and the European meetings uh, that will help deliver progress on climate and the economic rebound? Well, I think there will be um, discussion of goals, um, but, but actually delivering on those is more of a national uh, discussion uh, you know, than an international discussion. And, and, and you know, this is where uh, you know, domestic politics does have a profound impact on international affairs. You know, the Biden administration hopes to use uh, an infrastructure bill uh, to begin the process of weaning the American economy away from fossil fuels uh, and towards more uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, it's unclear at this point 
you know, whether Congress is going to deliver uh, uh, that bill uh, in, in a meaningful forum that, that helps uh, you know, the United States fulfill its uh, climate goals. So, so yes, this, this is a major challenge for the United States and others. Uh, is is you know once you set the asp policy aspirations, can you deliver concrete results? That's not going to happen this week, but it, it, it certainly needs to happen this year. Uh, Carol Lano, uh, the, the the same point to you. Given the the internal divisions, we've heard they know the internal divisions in the U.S. Uh, could scupper any attempts to pass the, these kinds of transformative. Uh, legislation and, and policies is very similar situation in the EU. Do, do you think anything concrete will happen or is this a very, very long and slow road that uh, leaders worldwide are all on? No, I think, let's say, they were certainly on the green agenda, which was just uh, discussed uh, where Europe is already very well advanced, uh, probably the most advanced in the Western world. And where we have the COP26 meeting, let's say, of all the members at the United Nations level, let's say, working uh, on climate change. I think with the G7, they want, will want to make concrete steps to make sure that at the meeting later this year in Glasgow, let's say that we can come to tangible results. And there are many things, let's say, on, the, on that level which have to be tackled. It is just expanding, let's say, who is covered by the whole um, emissions trading scheme, let's say, and a reduction of emissions. But it's also introducing, as I said a moment ago, I mean, a carbon price in more jurisdictions. Europe is the only jurisdiction in the world which has an emissions trading system which is working at the moment. And the emissions costs have increased recently, showing that the system works. But we need to expand this. And there is one very difficult thing related to that. If the others do not have a carbon price, I mean, will we have a what we call a carbon border adjustment mechanism to tackle this? So that could be a really a big hindrance to international trade if we don't have an agreement with this. If Europe tries to, from its side, with these systems, tackle climate change and the others don't want to do it, then we have a big friction for international trade. So that can be worked on. There are also, as I said, other elements. China is also making its steps on the climate change agenda, but this will have to be combined, for example, with taking a, seeing position from that on China, Okay. And then probably from the G7, seeing more lenient positions on issues related to human rights. OK, so we're in the final minutes of this debate. Uh, China has, of course, been the elephant in the room here. We've been skirting around it all debate. Uh, Vladimir Sotnikov, uh, do you think that uh, people should be talking with China more to tackle these issues uh, before any progress can be made? Yes, I think so. You're, you're correct in understanding this. My point is that... Uh, Actually, no one can neglect the position of China, and uh, actually uh, both uh, the United States and the European Union or J7 should actually uh, talk more to China, first of all, first of all, just to uh, um, diminish any, any fears that uh, China could uh, uh, do something in the opposite, I mean, that uh, should be a threat. Uh, and secondly, just understand the position of China and try to negotiate, to negotiate, uh, uh, and to have an agree from China on these global issues, like my colleagues uh, just uh, have mentioned. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all of my guests, PJ Crowley, Carol Lanu, and Vladimir Sotnikov. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me and the whole team, it's bye for now.